On this episode of Inside Boxing Live, we're going to break down the big fight that goes down in Las Vegas, the trilogy, Canelo Alvarez, Gennady Golovkin. But we're going to look at it a little differently. We're going to look at where these guys have been in their last couple of fights, everything that leads up uh, to this trilogy, their last five fights, how we got here, who's up, who's down, all of that. A lot of headlines, too. Fury Joshua seems to be changing every minute. We might be getting that fight. Shields and Marshall obviously postponed. Let's get into it. Let's go. What is up, everybody? Welcome into another edition of Inside Boxing Live presented by John Boy Media. And once again... He's back for another episode. Obviously, we did something right, Chris, because we're back for our second episode together. Of course, former WBO junior lightweight champion, former ISKA kickboxing champion. Do I have to do like the the bio every single time, or can I just go with just former world champ? No, no, former world champion is fine. I mean, we're talking boxing. Let's, <laughs> let's go with that. Well, how has it been? One week. You're you're one week in as an official podcaster. I think the uh response was overwhelmingly positive which i love uh but how does it feel uh, one week in official john boy media employee official boxing pot uh, podcaster you know i was a little bit worried because this day and age it's pretty easy to get canceled so you know it's <laughs> gonna be <laughs> making out of the first episode i think i think we're good i think we're gonna be okay for at least for a bit yeah that was awesome i mean ring tv the nice write-up for us shout out dougie fisher uh saw a lot of stuff so randy couture on instagram liked it is that your yes, boy? Yes, that's that's my boy. That's my boy. When I was uh, training out of Las Vegas back in oh, man, 2010, 2011, I was training out of Randy's gym. Randy is a huge boxing fan. So whenever whenever we, we came across each other, we were always talking boxing, which uh, more often than not, a lot of MMA guys are actually really big boxing guys. Well, we said that last week when we were talking mm -hmm. Silva, Jake Paul, like Anderson Silva. They love boxing first. That's like uh, that's, you know, it's been around so much longer than MMA. But yeah, I thought it was been a, it's been a good response. Uh, everyone's excited. I'm excited. I know you are, too. We're going to get it rolling. This weekend is huge. Obviously, Triple G Canelo. Um, Canelo Triple G. I got to get that right. It's Canelo first, then, then it's Triple G. But we got some big plans, man. Obviously, we got this show coming out. We're going to be doing a live show Friday directly after the weigh-in in studio. Chris will be here in New York City at the John Boy Media uh, offices. Uh, right the second after they touch the scales, we're going to be live on YouTube, breaking it down, breaking down the fight. Uh, our predictions, we'll have my, have my same game parlay. And then the big one, Saturday night, we got a live watch party from the John Boy Media live stream lounge, the DraftKings live stream lounge, 8 o'clock Eastern. We're going to be streaming the fight and reacting. Uh, it's going to be awesome. That's something I cannot wait to do. Yeah, me, me too. I'm, I'm super excited about that. Um, you showed me around John Boy offices that that one time we got to see, you know, the, the layout for where this fight, this fight viewing party is going to be. I'm very excited to to chill out, sit in those comfortable chairs, watch this awesome <laughs> fight. And uh, yeah, man, I mean, I, I've done a few watch parties before live. They're a lot of fun and people really tune in and they get to see the reactions as 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 they come. Yeah. Are you ready for four hours live? get me of course i am <laughs> four hours i'm like oh damn how am i gonna i usually do an hour here on a podcast i was like damn four hours i was thinking like i got to come up with some like side stories get into like your childhood i was like what are I we gonna start talking about i'm used to being live for for all these any know. any given fight night i can be four or five hours live and it, yeah. you know, it is what it is we got plenty to talk about that night so on the john boy boxing youtube page 8 p.m eastern if you order the fight you know you can watch along with us if you don't order the fight uh, you can watch along with us, too. That's the whole point of a, of a, a companion uh, a watch party, uh, a live stream. That's going to be awesome. It's something we're going to do a lot of at, at John Boy Media now with John Boy Boxing is uh, some some watch party. So I'm excited for that. Excited for all the content uh, that, that's coming uh, your way soon. But let's get into it. Let's, before we get to Triple G and, and Canelo, let's get into some of the headlines, Chris. Uh, obviously, Tyson Fury, Anthony Joshua is once again taking over the boxing world. Biggest headline. Uh, right now, I think it's almost superseding the fight this weekend is uh, Anthony Joshua has called Tyson Fury's bluff. He has said, OK, yeah, I'll fight you December 3rd. I'll take 40 percent. What's up? Let's see it. Now, it went from, I thought, Fury trying to call out Joshua and, and maybe call him on his bluff. Joshua has now returned it. Now, the 60-40 split, they're OK with it. I mean, I, I from all of everything that looks like it, it, it might be happening. This fight actually might be happening. 
Well, I said that on the first episode. I thought that the fight was going to happen. I mean, it, it's it's silly to walk away from that amount of money. Um, I didn't think it was going to happen December December third. I still don't, but they're saying that it is. I mean, we'll we'll, we'll see when we get there. This is boxing, but uh, yeah, no. I mean, the, the, in terms of Joshua taking the fight, dude, he he's calling him out. The opportunity's there. It's too much money to walk away from. This is a gigantic, gigantic fight. Um, it makes no sense for them for them to walk away now. So if it if you're saying like you don't think it's gonna happen December third, you could see them agreeing to something later for for more yeah. of a build up. I no, I think I think the I think the fight happens next for both of them. I just don't believe it's gonna it's gonna come together December third. Um, there, I mean that, that that's really close in terms of mega fight potential the way this fight is, and also you know with with the uh, the Queen just passing and everything that's going on over there, that's that's a fight that's gonna garner a lot of a UK attention. I mean world attention. But um, I think a little more time is probably smart. What about the Queen passing kind of threw a wrench into our show last week? Not that yeah. that's like a very small aspect of, of the show, but obviously we spent the entire, uh, I would say, 50% of last episode talking about <laughs> Shields and Marshall. And then I'm looking at my phone and I see that the, the, the Queen is in is in a bad shape. And, and I'm like, well, I, I didn't put two and two together. I didn't realize like that they were going to cancel – a bunch of fights and that, that was wild. I had to go back in and do a disclaimer. I literally sat down at the desk. I felt like I was actually reporting like real news for the first time in my life, not talking just nonsense boxing. I was like, excuse me, the, the queen has passed. So when you listen to this episode, you're going to hear uh, us break down a fight that obviously is not happening. But yeah, I, I do think that I don't know. I don't know what to think anymore with this. I, I thought that Fury kind of just put that out, doing what he does, just talking trash. Didn't really think that Joshua was going to take it. Uh, will take the fight because if you look at it from Fury's standpoint, makes a lot more money than Usyk. Where is Usyk in all this? I don't understand why Usyk did he just just get looked over because you know what he doesn't bring in as much money as these two. You know he's got three of the belts. Eventually they're gonna have to fight him. There's no one really out there for Usyk to fight. Where's Usyk in all this? Listen, Usyk is the man. Obviously he just beat Anthony Joshua twice. He's got all the belts, um, or he's got the you know he's got the belt, and, and then Tyson Fury is now. You know, he's really the cash cow. He's the man. And this fight's happening because of Joshua and him makes sense. And it's a mega, mega fight over there. You got two guys from 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 across the pond. Um, they've, they've been talking about this fight happening for a long time. I always wanted this fight to happen. Um, obviously, Usyk got in the way. But, um, you know, this, this is one of those fights that was, that was meant to happen. And it's something I think that always enticed Fury. And now that it's it's possible he'll he'll come out of his quasi retirement whatever you want to call it and go make that big check you know what if joshua does take this and i tweeted this out i don't want to hear any negative things said about anthony joshua anymore this is a guy who did not have to fight alexander Usyk. did not have to take that that is the definition of high risk low reward uh yep. he went out and defended his wbo uh, obligations uh, obviously wanted to fight fury last year but the Deontay Wilder, you know, uh, lawyer came in and, and ruled that they had to fight a third time. So what did Joshua do? He could have took a lighter touch. He could have waited for Fury and, and Wilder to figure it out last October. He fights Alexander Usyk, who's one of arguably the toughest out in all the boxing. And now he's going to go right to Fury from here. A lot of people, myself, criticize his in-ring stuff. That's what we do. That's the nature of our, you know, the, being a boxing uh, in the boxing media. But you really can't talk about what he does out, uh, you know, outside the ring. Or you really can't talk uh, negatively about his resume because I think he has the best resume among all the heavyweights right now. And if he fights Fury, it's head and shoulders better than the rest. I, I know. I, I 100% agree. What he's done in the ring in his career so far, I mean, it's stellar. And he's been one of my favorite heavyweights for a long time. Again, the after the ring stuff, emotions are flying high. After fights are tough. Coming off two back-to-back -back losses, really, really tough. Um, but, yeah, no, I mean – Going right to this, like, I get it. He's taking a page out of Chris Algieri's book. He's going right from Pacquiao to the con. <laughs> <laughs> get it it's now while easy... it's hot, right? Exactly. It's not the easiest route. In this sport, opportunities don't arise that often. But when they do, you got you to gotta snag them. Yeah, you got to. I mean, it, it, that's another thing. It's like, wait, we, should we let this marinate? Should we make this, you know, fight a little bit even bigger? It, it, even if it's a couple months, I, I still think uh, these two, I've clearly realized, like, now, the time is now. And it's something that we talked about last week. It's like, the, the order shouldn't matter as long as these these guys get in the ring. Uh, Usyk's waiting in the wings. Yeah, but Fury, I mean, Joshua is is if he this actually comes through and he actually does this, man, props to him. 
uh, for everything he did. But just you were on the call for, for that championship fight. And your comment, I thought, was like, after he went on that tirade, you were like, well, that was interesting. Like, yeah. <laughs> I didn't get your thoughts on that. What was what did you make of all that? Because I've asked a lot of different people in boxing world. You know, I, I wanted to get more of a, a broader sense of what happened. Because when it's happening live, especially when, you know, we, we're, we're not seeing all angles. And, you know, a lot of those angles came out later. But yeah, no, it was, it was odd. It was very odd. It was bizarre. That's really the word that comes to mind. I think I think uh, my broadcast partner Chris Mannix said that on the air. That was that was bizarre, um, and it was. But you know, in hindsight, thinking back to it, thinking about how emotional after fights can be. You know, I've been there. I've wanted to just. I've wanted to quote unquote freak out and you know do whatever and say what I want to say. I mean, it's tough, man. We 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 put our lives on the line for one, but also we put our lives on hold during camp. You're looking at two three months where the only thing you're thinking about is winning. We don't think about the fight. We think about winning the fight. And, you know, to not can be earth shattering. And especially for someone like Anthony Joshua, who has the earth on his shoulders at times, it seems, you know, when you're, especially when you're the heavyweight champion of the world, you know, it's a lot to take in. Um, Again, I'm sure he's going to look back at that and be like, wish I didn't handle that that way, (laughs) but you know, that's, I thought it was like when you're on live TV, right. In the moment I was like, what the hell is he doing? Like, this is insane. We've never seen anything like this. It's taking away from Usyk's moment It's bizarre. He kind of did it uh, when he fought Ruiz too, after he lost to Ruiz, but on on a lesser scale. Mm -hmm. But then again, it was like, you know what? This is probably the realest moment of his life. This is a guy uh, of his, at least of his professional boxing career, who has, like you said, the weight of the world on his shoulders has all these, uh, you know, companies that he's aligned with, you know, he's the head, you know, the face of boss, he's this, that, and the other, all these different endorsements, uh, the face of British boxing, so much pressure on him, a guy that started boxing late. Uh, but you know what, that's all, we'll just look at that and we'll say that's just the, the, his emotions got the better of him, but man, you can't deny, uh, once, uh, if he takes on Fury now, uh, that is going to be something special. Uh, but that's going on uh, heavyweight division. Another headline, Chris, obviously we just talked about how Shields Marshall uh, postponed. Um, that was a whole new, a whole wrinkle. I was expecting on this episode to, to talk about uh, two outstanding fights in, in women's boxing and break them all down, but they're going to be getting in the ring October 15th and October 15th. Now is like the Super Bowl of boxing. If you take a look at the schedule, Wilder Hellenius at night from the Barclays center, Camposos Haney, uh, over in Australia, then you got Shields Marshall during the day, and I think I'm probably leaving one out. I have would have to pull it up, but anyway, the fight is postponed. Uh, how hard is it from a fighter standpoint getting to that peak level? Go through an eight week camp, maybe even longer. Uh, all the media flying out there. This in this case, flying across the country. Three of the four. Uh, top, the the main and Maine were from United States. Only to learn that the fight is off. How tough is that, and how hard is it going to be for for these women to ramp up again for a fight uh, which is a month away? First of all, it's absolutely gut wrenching to go through. Like I said, about putting your life on hold for training camp to to put do all the sacrifices, make the way, travel over there. For the biggest opportunity of your career, that was the biggest opportunity for all four of them. And for it to fall through the way that it did, at, literally at the 11th hour, is gut-wrenching and heartbreaking. I felt for them. I, I mean, as a fighter and being in situations not nearly that bad, but those kind of situations, man, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's rough. To restart camp is a really difficult thing because I think some of those, some of those ladies are going to want to just train right through it which might be dangerous and maybe might be de- detrimental and could change the outcomes of, of these fights when they do actually happen wow. because overtraining is a real thing. So if these fighters don't pull back, if they're, if their coaches aren't able to pull them back, pull the reins on the, on these, you know, high drive type a fighters, uh, we could see some different results because the fight was postponed. That's very interesting. I never thought of like that, but one thing I, I do I would say is in the boxing era now, post COVID, this was something that happened. It was commonplace now where fighters would yeah. have to overtrain fighters have to restart. Maybe there's a little more, I would say research. Maybe there's a little more experience. Some of these trainers and some of these camps can maybe reach out uh, to some other fighters who experienced this during the COVID uh, boxing days where fights were getting postponed um, an extra month. I mean, look at the, you know, Jamel Herring and uh, who did he fight? The smaller guy. And, um, that fight got um, postponed a million times. Uh, yeah. There were so many of them. There were so, I was going to come to me and say, Carl Frampton, that's what it was. That fight was postponed numerous times. And, you know, there was a ton of that happening. 
Uh, so maybe it's from that standpoint, they could figure out how uh, to go about what they should do. But I, and that's an interesting standpoint of how this can affect uh, the fights now. I mean, we, we pretty much gave our picks last week. Uh, I still expect uh, Meyer to win, and I still expect uh, Marshall to win. But you got to figure uh, Marshall benefits a little bit from this because she could just stay in her home country. Yeah, no, not having to have to travel is huge. Um, but I, it really, like, my picks might change. You know, as we get closer, I want I would like to see what's going to happen these next few weeks um, and see how each of these fighters take it. But um, this, yeah, it's, this is a really, really interesting caveat to this whole discussion of of these these fights. So I'm curious to see how these these next couple of weeks are going to show, and we got to see, you know, what happens with whatever news reports come out and and, and social media from from these fighters, and really got to put a put a keen eye on on uh, how they're going to deal with the stresses of of this postponement. Well, you already had you already heard my picks. I gave my picks last episode, and that uh, was going to be my same game parlay, and I was going to win that one. I felt it. I felt it. Deep uh, down inside. I mean, I, I didn't disagree with both your picks, but <laughs> guess I what? felt I guess we'll, it. We'll see. I'm giving my same game parlay pick tomorrow on tomorrow's episode. I've been doing a lot of research on that. Um, I'm going to win. I'm going to win. Damn it. I lost another one too. In our NFL, we have an against the spread. Pool what are you, now. 0-9 now? 0-9? I'm, uh, someone on Twitter will point it out. Someone hit me the other day. I was like, have you won one of these yet? And I was like, you're blocked. I was like, I'm like <laughs> positive vibes only. <laughs> Positive vibes only. Come on. I oh, you're, quick, you're quick on the on the trigger for the blocks. No, okay. I'm not a block guy. I'm a mute guy. If you mute, oh, okay. if you mute, you'll, you'll learn as you're going to start tweeting more. If you mute, mute someone, they don't know. So they don't know they're muted. Mm. So they can keep responding to you, but I'm not seeing it. That's, a be- that's the beauty of it. Gotcha. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting back to my Twitter game, especially since I feel like I've been shadow banned on, on Instagram. So I'm going gonna, gonna to actually tweet more you got to pivot pivot to twitter and i have been blocking a lot because i've been tweeting this is a big week of um jake paul news this was a big week of nate diaz this was a big week of this social gloves did you catch that over the weekend no social gloves social gloves oh. bro that sounds like what i think it is i'm, I'm really not interested <laughs> it was a mess i didn't order it we weren't working it we Provided stats for the first one, but not this one because they, I think they're going through a little bit of financial issues. But Austin McBroom was the main event. I don't know who he is, but the kids at work told me he's like a YouTuber, like a family YouTuber. He fought. I saw, I saw the clips of these. I, I, I didn't realize it was called the social gloves, but that makes sense. He got knocked out bad. Like Jack Reese is under a lot. Jack Reese is under a lot of heat because five knockdowns. You know, he was, I thought on the third or fourth, he had nothing but broom and he got I would give credit to this guy Aceon Gibb who that's the guy he fought Jake Paul beat him a few years back he actually yeah, looked Gibbs, yeah. he looked mm-hmm. decent he he actually looked decent he was countering and uh actually put out a tweet I said you know this social influencer boxing is going to get someone killed and I got oh, I've, been, I've been saying that for a long time this, dude this I got dangerous. ripped these kids were coming after me I was the ire of influencer boxing for about 24 hours I mean it is it's it's like these guys are not trained to slip punches. These guys are not trained to – there's no defense. That's the thing. Like, oh, yeah, you could throw haymakers. And first of all, it's not even good boxing. It's yeah, ugly. It's ugly. Yeah. I mean, no, their, their brains aren't used to taking these shots. Their jaws are not used to being clinched and holding a mouthpiece in their mouth. You know, it, the the risk of injury is massive, and it's just a matter of time. Yeah, it was, yes, and Le'Veon Bell in the co-main event. Former NFL running back knocked out Adrian Peterson, also former NFL running back. Crazy, crazy. I Everybody wants it. to box. I mean, I get it. Boxing's awesome, but like, people gotta understand how dangerous this is. It's a dangerous thing, and and uh, people were chirping. The responses were like, you know what? You know what's really dangerous? The uh, you know, matchmaking like Tijuana and prospect matchmaking. I said, okay, yes, it is. Why can't? two things be true at once that's the thing with twitter that it's very yeah. frustrating there's no nuance it's like yes i'm very aware that the matchmaking and boxing at the on the lower levels when a when a very good fighter has to you know like richard torres w- were you at that fight oh you you watched that fight i was yeah i was yeah richard watched, torres yeah. richard torres that one had me shook you yeah. know that one was that was rough that was I, had, I had lou debella on the following week and he's like i've made fights like that it's very hard for us promoters and matchmakers to match these guys uh, in their first 10 fights, because there's such a, a, you know, a gap in skill 
But it's true. The two things can be at the true at the same time. Two things can be right at the same time. Yes, there's a problem with matchmaking. And yes, these influencer boxers, someone's going to get seriously hurt. And when they get seriously hurt, and worst case, God forbid, someone dies in there, what does it fall on? Boxing. Yeah, but at, so at we least have to answer for it. At least the matched, you know, the matched opponent from Tijuana understands the risks. I don't think these YouTube kids have any idea. They don't understand how dangerous this is. It's, it's, that's very different. And that's, and that's, you know, and that's something. And also where these kids are, the, the YouTubers are coming, the commission can't really oversee that in any way because they have no idea. They have no idea what their skill levels are. That's They're just the showing up and like, what do you, how do you, how do you pick which guy is overmatched and not? You have no idea. There's, there's nothing to go off of. So right. yeah, it's it's a it's the wild wild west when it comes to matching these kids up. That's why you know Jack Reese is one of the best referees in boxing. Great ref, Great like ref. he had a bad night because I wouldn't be shocked if he was like I don't know if this continue to can continue to go on. Well, uh, they were knocking each other down back and forth, right? Like it was, it was like uh, you know a lot of people. Uh, like, when I started looking more at the responses, I was getting it was like oh this is what this was one of the best influencer boxing fights of all time. It was evenly matched. You're an idiot. You don't know like this is the example you're going to use. That wasn't like the point. Like I, it, they're all evenly matched at that level. They both, they're neither of them are, are world beaters. Oh, it's a, it's a bar fight. <laughs> That's what I mean. Every, every bar like, fight is evenly matched. But listen, I, I will say this, like a lot of it is, it is there is some positive to take out of it. Like the marketing side, like the, you know, the, the buildup. I, I've said it for a while now, everything, but the actual fights are fun. <laughs> like the yeah. buildup. The the marketing, the matchmaking, uh, how these guys uh, promote themselves, the show. Their walkouts like, are actually pretty good too. Up until the first bell, they're actually a lot of fun. Exactly. Right. Up until I'm not sounding like a hater. Up until the first, oh yeah, that first bell, it's awesome. But I just wish like that some of these kids that all tune in for this. I'm like, man, if you guys only watch the you real, really fight, watch real fights, yeah. Right. Like if you watch like a, a Spence and a Crawford or this weekend. Or any of the great fights we've had over the last 18, 24 months, even go further than that, man. It, it's you can't get them all together, but whatever. I, I pissed off a lot of influencer boxing fans. I, I honestly don't care. I think you'll be okay. <laughs> I think I'm I gonna think be you, fine. I think you'll be all right. Uh, but I like Jake Paul. I will say that. I I, I kind of put him in a different class. I put him. No, like, no, he 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 trains for real, and he's got real people around him. Um, and even me calling out that I think Silva's going to beat him. That's just my opinion. I think Silva's going to beat him. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that Jake Paul doesn't put in work, um, but mark my words. He's going to lose that the fight. The train is over. You said it. It's out there. And then, the... Well, in, in terms of his boxing, yeah. The, the, the Jake Paul boxing train, <laughs> he makes a lot of money doing everything else he does. Well, he's got he's a, gonna, yeah. yeah. He's, he's got not going to stop all that. Right. He's got a new better betting platform called like micro betting where you can bet on like balls and strikes. You can bet like on all these. He's always going to make money uh, yeah. somehow. But did you catch any of the um, Jake Paul Anderson Silva press conference? I thought it was interesting because we're used to Jake. These press conferences, I've been out to a bunch of them. There's like a lot of like tension and he's always looking for a way to clown his opponent. There was none of that in this one. He had just straight up respect for Silva. Well, I mean, it's Anderson Silva. If you don't have respect for Anderson Silva, you're you're an idiot. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that shows you how he's going to approach this fight. You know, how serious he knows this fight is. Um, something I saw was that this is the first opponent that Jake Paul's fighting who's taller than. So he's not going to be the bigger man. And even when they were matched up, you know, Jake Paul looks a little thicker and heavier, but um, you know that height and reach advantage, their size is pretty pretty close. You know, so. Yeah. Jake Paul fighting someone who's his size. Tyron Woodley, much smaller man. Oh, ben Askren, much smaller yeah. man. Gibbs, way smaller guy. And then um, who was the ba the basketball player? Nate Robinson. That doesn't even count. Yeah, point so, guard. That's what, that doesn't count. <laughs> that doesn't count. But you know, this this is uh, he's got a real guy in front of him, even from a just from a physical stature. Yeah, that was interesting to watch. I'm gonna keep an eye on uh, Jake Paul Anderson Silva. I'm I'm into that one. I'm gonna be definitely tuned in. I think it's October. 29th which is another night where there's like three fights in, in the same night crazy uh let's get to our DraftKings sports book uh football season has kicked off chris teams are celebrating their first wins of the season like my new york football giants what a win for them uh they're revisiting the game plan whether your team won or lost in week one DraftKings sportsbook an official sports betting partner of the nfl is giving you a shot at an easy dub new customers all you have to do is bet five dollars on any NFL wager, and you instantly receive $200 in free bets. That's right. DraftKings Sportsbook. All new customers, $200 in free bets. All you got to do is put place any $5 or more wager 
on the football team of their choosing. Same game parlay, something we've been talking about and doing a lot uh, on this show. You can find multiple bets uh, from the same game to give yourself a shot at even bigger winnings. Uh, for those of you in states that don't have sports betting, but there are a few states that don't have sports betting. I feel like every state's going to have it soon. Don't forget DraftKings Daily Fantasy, where you've been innovating ways uh, to win some cash all football season long. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers, all you got to use is promo code BOXING, and you receive $200 in free bets instantly when placing a $5 wager. That's promo code Boxing only at DraftKings and over on YouTube. You can see um, all of the information on that. All right, Chris, let's get into the main event of the show, the main event of the weekend while we're all gathered here, the trilogy. Canelo Alvarez, Gennady Golovkin, whether you like it or not, whether you want this fight to happen or not, is here. Uh, four years after their their second fight, and uh, it's a big fight. It's definitely going to be a good fight. Uh, maybe not as big as the promoters are speaking it up to be. I think you really can't fool boxing fans. And I love Gennady or the Golovkin. Betting, or the betting line. You can't fool them <laughs> no, either. You don't fool Vegas, and you don't fool yeah. the boxing fans. Uh, I think fans are somewhat excited. This isn't the same buzz as like a Crawford Spence. And I think a, a lot of that, and I love Gennady Golovkin. I'm going to pin it on him is because of what he has done or lack of what he's done since 2018 and their last fight. Canelo's done his part. Canelo has taken off after that fight in 2018 to levels that I don't think any of us could have foreseen. 175, what he did clearing out uh, 168. To me, that's the reason why this fight, I feel like, isn't like feeling like a super duper fight. It's because Golovkin's 40 and he has barely fought uh, in the last four years since their last fight. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if this fight happened two years ago, I think it would be a totally different feel. That being said, I'm still excited. I've watched both of the, both of their first fights this week a couple times. I mean, they just they just go together. They make for great fights. Yeah. So I'm I'm hoping that uh, Golovkin can can pull back the hands of time and go right back to to what he did in those first two fights and 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 push Canelo to to new levels. Um, but yeah, I know. I agree. I, in terms of what, what they've been doing lately and that's all that matters in boxing. It's, it's what have you done for me lately is, 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 uh, as the saying is old as time in boxing, uh, Canelo has been on an absolute tear. I mean, he has stepped up levels beyond and Golovkin has been underwhelming is probably the best word for it in his past couple of fights. Um, obviously still, still winning all of his fights, but he had some, uh, close call in there with Sergey Derevchenko. Mm. Um, you know, he was, had a long time off and then came back with says, says which who cares? And then the Murata fight, another really tough fight. One that was a lot tougher than I expected, but, um, I don't know. I got a feeling that triple G is going to show up and we're going to have a real fight. I, I just think these guys match up in a, in a way that is special. Even, you know, I, I, again, I was watching the fights. I'm watching how these guys go neck and neck, and they're able to dig deep when they really need to. Can Golovkin still do it at 40? Yeah, that's the question. That's, that's the question. The question. It's, I mean, it's always Cause, cause the question. Because he can do it. Right. It's always the question with these older fighters. It's like we're always waiting for Pacquiao to fall off that proverbial cliff and get old overnight. Um, he, it did when he fought yeah. Ugas. Um, it wasn't like he got knocked out. He fought to the last bell. He just couldn't get his punches yeah, off. Defense Pacquiao, wasn't there. Every version of Pacquiao beats Ugas, except for the one that showed up on that night. It's just I don't, and that's 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 age. He, you know, Pacquiao is is light years ahead of 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 your Dennis Ugas. I mean, any other time, you know, he beats him, and that just shows you. And he knew it, and that was why he packed it in. I was like, oh, that's this isn't for me anymore. Yeah, I, yeah. I got old overnight, as they said. Let's before we get into that, all, all that and and I'm gonna we're gonna look at Golovkin's fights since Canelo. We're gonna look at Canelo's fights since Golovkin. I have never asked you this. Who did you have winning first and second fight? It's like our generations, uh, not Hagler Hearns, our generations, a uh, Leonard versus Hagler. It's like the, the debate will rage on forever between uh these two fights. That's the beauty of this trilogy. That's why there's so much history. So that being said, Chris. Uh, who did you have winning the first two fights? That's one of the most complicated questions in boxing. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I've spent, especially, I literally just watched both fights again today to score them and to figure out where I lie in this question. So first fight was a draw. I had Golovkin winning that fight. 
I don't second fight. That. Second fight. Canelo won the fight. I had that fight either a draw mm-hmm. or Canelo winning the fight. Okay. So it's pretty much as far as I'm concerned, it's one one. And this is going to be the deciding the, the deciding fight. So when you were saying earlier when we were coming on the telecast, like, oh well, I gotta call it Canelo Triple G. In my head, I'm like, well, yeah. I don't really think so. Yeah. I think it's one one. I really think it could go either way. So, you know, I, I think I think he got robbed of a victory in that first fight, Triple G did. Mm-hmm. Um, and the second fight was razor thin. Yeah. Um, I think they should have built that up more with the promotion. Uh, the promotion was bad blood. The promotion was Canelo, like the stare downs, getting in the face, getting up close, saying all these negative, nasty things about him. They should have played up more that this is 1 1. Like, you know, like I know that Matchroom probably wouldn't do that because that would have, you know, went against Canelo, uh, you know, getting th- that draw in, in the first in the first fight but that to me but it's also there's another caveat to that because if you do call it one one and then triple g wins triple g wins the series in terms of the, the public view we yeah. are not going to get a fourth fight so if, well, if you say it that way you know it, it opens the door for a fourth fight that's true and who is match more invested in the way more invested in in canelo and they are uh, uh Golovkin. Well, i think that's boxing a... is i think everyone is yeah I mean, to there, a certain degree there's, there's, yeah there's more potential to, to a certain degree, yeah, I agree. I thought the first fight was clearly Golovkin. I mean, he just controlled the fight with his jab. Such an unbelievable mm-hmm. performance with the jab. He's still the best jabber in boxing right now. There's, he's the only active fighter, Golovkin, to land more than 10 jabs per round and more than 30% overall. He's still got that. He's still got that punch, and he had that in, in the first fight. Um, The only thing was, like, down the stretch, I thought maybe Golovkin could have done a little bit more, but that's when Canelo picked it up. Uh, I think in the eighth round on is when Canelo started to find a home uh, for those power shots. But I thought Golovkin won the first fight. He was, he was I don't like to use the word robbed, but he was robbed of his moment. Like He was robbed yeah. of yep. like the coronation of his <laughs> career. And if you take a look at it, these are two fighters that were treated very differently uh, throughout their careers. Um, whether it was coming up or whether how was their perceived, you know, two fighters that have gone a completely different paths uh, since their, their last fight. But, you know, Canelo was, was literally the golden boy. He was signed to, to Golden Boy Promotions. He was promoted. He was under Floyd Mayweather pay-per-views. He was clearly the next big thing where Golovkin was, uh, you know, toiling. And, uh, you know, it, he, no one really knew what he was. Uh, fighting in obscurity. Finally comes over to the to the States. Uh, fights upstate New York. Small crowd. Obviously, he was on HBO, though. Then he starts to blow up. But he still was never, like, on the same level popularity-wise as as Canelo, I think that's where and a lot was of not the making the, comes. And, and not making that money either. He wasn't no. making, even when he was even when he was selling out the Garden and those you know three times a year, the money wasn't there. <clears throat> Excuse right. me. So yeah, that that bitterness when you look at a guy like Canelo who's driving a Ferrari at, at twenty five years old, silk so pajamas. You know, yeah, silk so pajamas. You're you're gonna have that. You're gonna have that feeling and that extra animosity for for Triple G. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's a big part of, of the the what goes down to the, the, the beginning of this. I know they were like, I wouldn't say they were friends, but they were like friendly. I know they had a sparring session. There was like a respect level the, between these two. And that obviously went out the window uh, with how they were treated. It went out the window, which led into the second fight with the banned substance and Clembruterol and Golovkin just going on off on Canelo. Uh, that's a big part of this too. But I, I would say the first fight Golovkin won. The second fight I think is when Canelo Alvarez became Canelo Alvarez and decided to stay in the center of the ring Mm -hmm. and say, you know what? I'm going to hold my ground against a bigger guy, a more powerful puncher. And not only did he win the fight, in my opinion, I thought he won over the Mexican fans. Uh, If you remember, Canelo wasn't, he was beloved, but he wasn't like he is now because I feel like Mexican fans did not like the way or did not have the same admiration for how he fought, kind of a counter puncher, slickster, not a Mexican style which Golovkin kind of coined, and I that pissed off uh, Canelo too. But I think in that second fight is when Canelo stayed in the center of the ring and showed Mexican fans and the boxing world, like, listen, I, I can stand and go shot for shot. And then obviously from there, he went to just unbelievable, uh, you know, accomplishments. Yeah, absolutely. So in the first fight, Canelo spent a major, I mean, a vast amount of time fighting with his back on the ropes. And was trying to counter from there. I didn't think he was that successful, especially when the, the time when he spent on the ropes was not a good idea for him. In the 12th round, there was a change. He came out hard in the 12th round, 
and went right at Golovkin. Threw our, opened up the, the, the 12th round with a big combination, landed some really good shots. Um, and he realized that if he went forward, the power of Golovkin wasn't the same as when he was going backward. So, or when, when Golovkin was coming forward. Mm -hmm. So I think he made a, a strategic adjustment in, in the second fight being like, all right, the 12th round, I'm making this round number 13. I learned that I can go, I can stare down the lion's gullet and I can fight him and I can be safe. And he, he used that in the second fight. Although I think the, in the, if you look back in the 10th round of the, uh, the rematch, Canelo got hit with a right hand, right on the chin. And it's the only time I've ever seen him anywhere close to rock. He, th he was throwing a left hook. He got hit with a shot. He, the, the left hand just went dead. Mm. And he fought those next three rounds like a guy who was literally fighting tooth and nail to, you know, he was hurt those last three rounds and was just fighting. And I, I agree with you. I think the Mexican fans saw the style that he, that he utilized all night, coming forward, fighting in the pocket, chin down, very, very Chavez senior-esque. And then him getting hurt and coming back and still fighting and staying in there. Very, very impressive performance from Canelo in the second fight. Yeah, that was 2018. HBO days. That was an HBO pay per view. Just to show how long ago it was that these guys fought. It was a, the I think it was the last million home pay per view. If you don't count like the Tyson Roy Jones exhibition, um, it was huge at the time. It was the first fight was massive. Uh, I remember it being like a few weeks after Mayweather McGregor. Uh, second fight just as big because of the how the first fight went down with the draw. And yeah, Canelo from that moment. Um, I thought he won. Uh, you thought he won. Uh, a lot of people, mm -hmm. I think the consensus was was that he won that one. I know people, some people out there say uh, it was a draw, but it was definitely an improvement. We'll, we'll, we'll say that. It was definitely a moment where Canelo, it could change the tide uh, of his career. But since after that is when he signed with the zone. Uh, his next fight, he went up to 168 uh, to fight Rocky Fielding. Uh, that was a wash. I was at that fight. Uh, it was awesome. Was to see. It was awesome, right? You were great. It was awesome to see Canelo at MSG. It was more of a spectacle uh, than that was a fight. Uh, but then he went on to, to unify with, with Danny Jacobs, uh, a fight where Canelo, I thought, obviously won that one. Uh, then he went up to 175 for the first time and beat and knocked out Sergey Kovalev. That was that crazy. Was, I was, that was awesome. That was so impressive. Uh, Kovalev, I mean, listen, that wasn't prime Kovalev, but it doesn't matter. Kovalev still Kovalev. He's a, he's a murderous puncher. He was actually winning that fight, too. He's utilizing his jab really well. Kovalev's a super strong guy. Um, and Canelo was really just stalking, stalking, stalking. And uh, was getting outpointed much much of the way of that fight. And then, you know, came on and, and scores the knockout of the bigger guy. Golov I mean, uh, um, uh, Sergey had never been knocked out like that. Kovalev never been so handled so, so like that. So, I mean, uh, that was such a statement. And one of those fights where you're like, wow, that's, that's really impressive to go up there and do that. Incredible. Yeah. That was the moment where then we started talking about all time greatness in terms of yeah. Mexican mm -hmm. fighters. When we started looking at him in a different light, like a really different light, because obviously smaller guy, uh, you, you unify with Jacobs, good win, uh, beating fielding. You know, that was more, like we said, more of a spectacle and everything he's done previous to the, the Golovkin uh, two fights, um, you know, fights with Lara, you know, fights with Trout, um, you know, fights with Cotto, still solid wins, but, Never in our wildest dreams at that moment did we think, can this guy go up to 175? And albeit didn't beat the best at 175, didn't beat uh, the top guy, but did beat a champ, did beat a guy in Kovalev who was still, you know, wasn't fully washed like he is now, but was still uh, in his prime somewhat. And to knock him out, that was a that was when we started to think of Canelo as like, wow, this guy, what can he really achieve? Can he maybe one day go up to heavyweight? Can he maybe like, you know, that's when you started to think and like letting your imagination go a little bit. Then Canelo goes on this run at 168 and he does it in like a calendar year, which really makes it impressive where in the era of fighters going twice a year, three, if we're lucky, he beats uh, Calm Smith. Impressive win, dominated Calm Smith. Yeah, Punched I him. thought that was going to be a real fight. I was really... So did I. We were that, wrong that, on that, that one. Went away with. Super wrong. Super wrong. Right. Punching him, hitting him on the, the bicep. Punching and... his arm, breaking him, busting his bicep up. I mean, winning every second of every round. I was, you know, Callum Smith's fantastic, and he just did not show up that night. And look what Callum Smith's up to now, just to show that that, that Callum Smith's a damn good fighter. Yes, he went up to 175 yep. now. He's with Buddy McGirt. Uh, I know you have a, like, a good relationship with, with Buddy McGirt, but look what Callum Smith has done since that uh, Canelo loss. I don't think he's lost since then. Uh, moved up to 175. Looks like a stud at, at, at no, 175. He knocked, he knocked everybody else since then. 
He's yes. 100% knock, uh, knockout percentage since then. I mean, he, he is a bad, bad boy, man. He is knocking guys dead. Yeah, so that there you go. That just shows what impressive win that was uh, for Canelo. Obviously, the Yildirim fight was very much like the <laughs> uh, Rocky Fielding fight. It was a mandatory. It was a, a something boxing like needed at the time. I think it was like the depths of COVID uh, winter, and it was like something yeah. a while. Were you at that one? I was. Yeah, I was in Miami. It was at the stadium, right? It was like yep. kind of full, but it wasn't full. It was like twenty thousand, but twenty thousand spread out. Yeah, it was. It was still COVID. It was weird. You know, we we had to rent out the entire hotel, the fight hotel, and like it was just fight people there. And then you know, traveling back and forth, and that, you know where you could go. It was it, it was strange, but it, like you said, it was very needed. And listen, Canelo did exactly what he was supposed to do with an overmatch opponent. He blasted him out of there. <laughs> oh man, that was, move on. Next, yeah. What's next? Was that yeah? And the thing with that one, with the what was more impressive. I think his Canelo's ring walk. Uh, I think he had Jay Balvin lasted like three times longer than the actual fight. So that was like <laughs> very good spectacle. Uh, on to the next. B.J. Saunders got him out of there. Oh. Pretty much retired. B.J. Saunders haven't seen him since. Uh, ruptured his eye socket. Um, some people thought Saunders was winning that fight. I don't know what they were watching. That was a nice performance from Canelo. I was there that night as well. Uh, it was 86, 84,000, something insane like that. I mean, I have never been in a crowd like that. And when he started yeah. going to the crowd, yeah. when he got, when he really had, when he had Billy hurt, you know, he knew he broke his eye. He, he, gave, he came back to the daughter corner and said that he busted his eye. Um, and he was really pouring it on. He's, he's getting the crowd. Like, I mean, feverish. They were just, it was going insane. It was the rafters were moving. Huh. It was absolutely insane. Um, for me to be front row in that fight, that was that that was a night I'll never forget. Yeah, that was a big one for for Canelo. Picks up another belt at 168. Then he goes to Caleb Plant, uh, hops over to the PBC side, uh, unifies, becomes our undisputed, wins all four belts at 168 in a calendar year, uh, knocks out Caleb Plant, uh, just solidifies himself at that point. He's on top of the world after he beat uh, Caleb Plant. I mean, if you take a look at that run right there. Uh, from the last Triple G fight to the plant fight. We're talking multiple weight classes. We're talking belts. We're talking 80,000 in attendance. Uh, face of boxing. There's no doubt about it. Saved boxing. And, and you can make that argument too. Knocking people out. Riding high. Can't get any higher than Canelo Alvarez during that run. Yeah, no. I mean, I, that's that's the, the the stuff of dreams for for a fighter in, in, your, in your career. And I mean, there was nothing else to do. He left no stone unturned. He's jumping weight classes. He's knocking out legends. He's coming back down. He's unifying. He was the boss and just telling everybody what he was going to do, and he did it. You know, the fact that he fought so so often, too, I thought that was so good for the fans. We need the face of boxing to be active. We've never yeah. had that. You know, he's, like you said, we've, we've been in the era of the two fights a year. Yeah, De La Hoya, you know, and then we got into the – Mayweather was kind of like that, that twice a year – guy that we always waited it was it was may and september yeah. may and september waiting for may and september uh but canelo throwing in fights in between i thought even if they weren't you know the yield rooms of the world that's cool i still want to see canelo i love a canelo fight week and i think fans do too well i agree 100 percent. i think that's so needed and that's the only way to 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 accomplish anything it's the only way to to make uh inroads in a sport that doesn't have a schedule a sport that doesn't have an uh, like a, an overarching a season, right? Season that doesn't have like an NBA, doesn't have a commissioner. It's up to you. So if you want to fight four times in a year, you're going to reap all the benefits. So not everyone can do it because not everyone has you know the fans don't or has, doesn't have the what should I say the the the, the poll, the money, the exactly. interest, the, everything. Yeah, you know, and not everyone has that. But Canelo obviously took um uh, took that and and ran with it. And I think a lot of that had to do with the fact of that he sat out for a while with the whole golden boy mess and he missed probably like a solid year of his career. Um, and he's like, you know what? I'm back. I'm going to be a free agent. I'm going to uh, fight on all these different platforms. But with all that being said, Chris, at least it was next fight with Bivol it was up to 175 again. No one told him to do that. No one said you have to. No one was clamoring for Dimitri Bivol versus Canal Alvarez. He could have fought Charlo. He could have fought someone else at one. Uh, Andrade. There's a slew of opponents uh, at 160 or 168 for Canelo to fight. So he goes up to 175 and fights Bivol, uh, going on five fights in 16 months against a guy that is damn good, who is huge, 
who has one of the best jabs in boxing, can move, can punch, and he loses. He loses. It did just... So did you see a sign of slippage in Canelo in that b-ball fight? No. <laughs> he just he flew too close to the sun. That's all it was. He just he, he there was no reason for him to go back to seventy five. I thought that was a bad idea in general. Second of all, so when he went to seventy five the first time, he went up and fought an aging Kovalev. Yeah. Now he's fighting a young, undefeated stud who can really, really fight, who we haven't seen his potential yet at all. I was in the corner when uh, Dimitri Bivol knocked out Sullivan Barrera. I was in Sullivan's corner. In the very first round, I saw him do something with his his range and his jab where I was like, and my first of all, immediately I was like, well, we're not winning this fight. The, the guy's ability to change range in and out and, and land a hard jab, I was like, oof, that's, that's special. And that's exactly what he utilized to beat Canelo that night. And I was saying it, anyone who would listen, this is – not an easy fight. This is a really actually bad fight. It's a bad idea. And uh, it turned out to be that. So no slippage. Is he not seeing any yeah. slippage in our boy Canelo? I don't think so. Maybe maybe psychologically thinking they could beat absolutely everybody, which is what I want a guy to think anyway. Right. Um, but I think maybe his handler should have been like, all right, relax. <laughs> we, don't, we don't need to jump up that much was... against a guy that level. You know, if you're going to – you listen, you was talking about going up the cruiserweight and fighting um, – Makabu. Uh, Makabu. Honestly, I'm okay with that. That makes more. That, I, I would be. I would be okay with that more than going up and fighting a guy like Bibble. Bibble because style of the is movement. A, the style is terrible. It's terrible. It was a terrible matchup. Matchup, even if they were the same size, and they're absolutely not. So, um, yeah, that, I think that was just a, a, a miscalculation on on the team's part. Interesting, because sixty-one fights for Canelo Alvarez, thirty-two years old, four hundred and forty-eight rounds. He has two hundred and twenty <laughs> more rounds fought than Golovkin. That's crazy. That 19 champions fought. That's the most in boxing. That's, he has the most rounds of any active fighter. He has the most fights of any active fighter. I think he's tied with Donaire in terms of champions fought with 19. Five fights in his last 16 months. And how about this? 52% of Canelo Alvarez's life has been spent as a professional boxer. <laughs> half of his 52%, life. 52%. More than half of his life has been spent as a professional boxer. Uh, hey, this the guy's doing what he loves. He's very good at it. He's making a ton of money. I mean, I I don't I don't see slippage. I, I he's he's still. I mean, he from what I've seen leading up to this fight, he's in ridiculous shape. He looks awesome. So obviously, he still has the drive. He still has the discipline. Um, you know. So I mean, more power to him. I I, I like I like when Canelo is around. I think it's of good course. for boxing. I think that um the the longer he can make this this go, and he's only thirty two. I had some of my best fights after after 30, and, and a lot of fighters have. And a guy who lived the lifestyle the way he does and be, is so active, I mean, who knows how. He'll, he'll, he'll go as long as he wants. I, I don't, I'm not saying I saw any any slippage. I do agree um, that Bivol was just the worst possible opponent. Uh, way too big. Stylistically. Like you're right, flew too close to the sun. 100%, 100% agree. But that's not, we're talking a long a long career. Started at at, at – as a teenager, um, a lot of fights, not taking a lot of punishment in these fights, which is a big, big thing, does not get hit, um, no. but did get marked up a little bit by Bivol. Maybe maybe not physically we're seeing a slippage, maybe mentally. I mean, it's a guy, like we said, 52% of his life as, as a professional fighter, we're seeing him uh, open up more and, and talk, speak English. He's golfing. You're seeing him enjoy it a little more, making a ton of money. I mean, good God, he is – making almost a hundred million a year easily that also has to come to, into play here. And one person that we're hoping is seeing a slippage in Canelo Alvarez is, is Gennady Golovkin, right? Yeah. I mean, if, if, if anybody can, can put it under the magnifying glass and expose the world and uh, elucidate this, this what kind of whatever slippage might be there or, or kind of questions that Canelo may have triple G you would hope would be the guy to do it. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll only know come Saturday. But I don't know. I don't know. I, I think a lot of that stuff is subjective. You know, think, saying if you're seeing slippage, if, if, if that's going to add up, there's no way to know mm -hmm. um, until you know. And that's kind of like getting the old overnight kind of kind of adage. You never know until it's there. That's why you're going to have to tune into John Boy Boxing YouTube page, 8 o'clock Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, to watch me and Chris watch a fight. I mean, that's a whole world. Did you know that that's a whole thing? People watching other people watch things. 
Well, yeah. I mean, the little kids, they watch people, kids play video games all the time. I have, I have nephews. I see them on YouTube <laughs> watching kids play video games. Like, what, what, what are we, what are we doing? Huge. But this will be a lot, this will be a lot more fun than that. As far as I'm concerned. We have a guy at our company, John Boy Media. His name is Joe's McFly. And he is the world's biggest Yankee fan. And he does Twitch streams every game of him reacting. And they are lit. Like they're crazy. Like people love them. Like the New Yorker magazine wrote a whole story on them. He has thousands of people watching him watch Yankee games. He, he he's pretty much a, a vlogger. So I'm excited. I'm excited to do that too. And, and I was talking to him about it and getting his thoughts and fight reactions hit way different than baseball reactions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hit, 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 hitting dingers and getting punched in the jaw way, <laughs> way different. So hopefully we see some some wildness and we can react and, and, and have fun on, on Saturday night. But, yeah, let's get into uh, Golovkin's uh, career. Uh, one last thing with, with Canelo, too, and it's, I think it's a big storyline in, in this fight. The fact that we talked about a bunch in, in this show is like how uh, Golovkin feels like he got cheated, uh, wronged. Um, you know, he, he should be the one that's being applauded. He should be the one making all this money. Well, he has a chance now to not only beat Canelo – but hand him his second consecutive loss, put his career into a tailspin. Another thing, too, is all four belts at 168 are on the line. Can, uh, Golovkin wins this fight. He is the undisputed champion at 168. No one's talking about that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. That's not getting mentioned at all. No one's really talking about this actually for a while time because everyone thinks about Canelo's last fight losing. So you're not thinking about him as still being champion. It's going back to his weight class. The belts are on the line. Golovkin's got to be, I mean, he's going to be start I, 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 chomping at the bit for this he's going to be i mean this is such a huge opportunity to catapult him really to the highest point of his career he wins this fight he's he's, he's at new levels new he's level. at new levels at 40 years old unbelievable he hasn't talked much about what he's going to do after this uh he says he is thinking about retirement and we and we know and you, and you can speak on this if you start using the r word you start thinking about the r word retirement that means you almost have one foot out the door uh, I don't think that will be the case. I think he's extra motivated, obviously, obviously for all the reasons uh, that, that we talked about. But let's talk about Golovkin's fights since uh, Canelo, Chris. Um, Steve Rolls, that was his first fight with the zone. Well, another thing is he was a free agent. Obviously, HBO disbanded. And there was a lot of talk. Where is he going to go? Is he going to go to the PBC? Because he can fight at Charlo. He can fight um, you know, all the guys that they had at, at, at 160. And then DAZN comes in and gives him a ton of money. Good for him because he's a guy, like we said, deserved it coming up the ranks, and he got a ton. I think $100 million for for three or four fights. And first fight was Steve Rolls. We all knew how that was going to go. That was a fight. Get back in the ring. Let's see you fight. The Dervinchenko fight. I was there ringside. Were you there for that? That one I was not. I was at Steve Rolls, but I was not there for Dervinchenko. Dervinchenko fight, I was there doing the copy box, and people ask me all the time, what's the most brutal fight you've seen live? Uh, you know, what's the craziest stuff you've seen live? It's up there in terms of the most brutal back and forth fights I've ever seen to the point where I remember leaving the arena and being like, this is what I do. This is like what I do for a living. I sit and watch these guys just go at it. And we leave, we go home, and I talk about it, whatever, on a podcast. What type of toll does it take? on the fighters because i think from that moment golovkin wasn't the same like that's the fight that was like damn he got old overnight right after that because he took so much punishment got hit the most he ever got hit in his career Derek Jekyll in like 180 power shots that's the fight that i think for golovkin it changed a lot and it was like oh shit like it's all catching up to me i'm in my late 30s yeah I, i've trained with Derek i've actually sparred Derek a few times i've never been so uncomfortable in a boxing ring as when i'm in the ring with that guy he is, he is swarming. He's overwhelming. He lets his hands go. I mean, he throws great combinations. He picks his punches really well. He's very, very precise. He's got good power. Um, yeah, he, he's a nightmare to fight no matter who you are. And, yeah, I agree. That fight was was absolutely brutal. You're watching two trains co collide over and over and over again during that fight. And, uh, yeah, I mean, those fights, they last, man. They linger. You have those tough fights. Like, you go, like you, you left and said, this is what I do for a living. The, 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 think about what the fighters are going through. They're going to the hospital and they're like, wow, is this really what I want to do with my life? Is this really, even at you know, an advanced age, you're still questioning what the hell am I doing here? Um, yeah, that fight was was absolutely brutal. And I'll tell you, man, Golovkin, I don't know if it was that fight. I don't know if it was before that fight. You never know. But he doesn't seem like he's been the same uh, since since then. 
I think that was the first night where he you saw a visible like visibly hurt. You like yeah. there, there was no punch. There was not one single moment in the twenty four rounds with Canelo where he looked visibly hurt. And there was no point no. in his career. No point in his career did he have a single moment where he looked invulnerable. He had a, a any sign on his face, any wincing. That's what we're talking. That's how much of an animal this guy is. Dervinchenko, that was the first time where I saw visible signs of a slowdown. I was like, yep. damn, this guy's human. This guy is mm-hmm. human. And he was in his late 30s. And it was after the, the 24 rounds with Canelo that also probably chipped away. But that fight right there with Dervinchenko, Madison Square Garden, um, was the night where uh, I was like, okay, we have to really start thinking about, um, you know, a boxing without uh, Golovkin. But he sticks around. He fights Zarameta. I know you were on the call for that one. Wasn't much of a fight. Uh, that was a he took a lot of time off, which he probably obviously should have from Dervinchenko to, to Zarameta to Murata, his last fight. You were on the call for that with our buddy, um, Corey Erdman. Corey another, Erdman, yeah, another tough, grueling fight, another tough fight where I walked away with a lot of questions about Golovkin. How much left does he have? You know, how much left in the tank does he have? Um, uh, visible uh, body shots landing off on him from, from Murata, where I saw wincing. What did you see in, in that Murata fight from Golovkin? Well, I saw that the Triple G who fought Murata, if, he, if that's the same guy who steps in the ring on Saturday, he's getting knocked out wow. because he started so slow. He was he was so vulnerable to the body. He got he got hit with the cleanest right hands I've ever seen Triple G get hit with that night. And Murata's a good puncher. He's not, you know, he's not the best puncher. Um, he's got a great right hand, and he landed a couple really good ones. Really, just walking Triple G into really big shots. Didn't roll with it like he normally does. Didn't have those reactions like he usually does. Doesn't that, that hand position that he normally does. Um, he, he showed a lot a lot of holes in that fight. And what boggles my mind is how do you go 24 rounds with Canelo Alvarez and never visibly get hurt to the body? And then every fight since then, you know, or two out of the four fights since then, visibly hurt wincing when getting hit with body shots. You know, you got a guy like Canelo, who's an absolute destroyer with left hook to the liver, one of the best that we've seen in years. And now you're getting visibly hurt by liver shots by guys who are not even, Murata's not a body puncher. That guy doesn't he throw body punches in any of his fights. He's a right-hand puncher. He's a one-twoer. So uh, that that raised a lot of question marks for me watching that fight. I was I was worried for for Triple G going into the, a Canelo fight after the Murata fight. What? Why do you think that is, though? Uh, is it age? Could be, could be age. It could be, uh, it could be the style. It could be the fact that they were over in Japan, you know, traveling sucks, traveling sucks on a, on a, on a big fight. Um, so, you know, it, it could be a number of things. It could be, you know, like you said, it could be the age finally catching up or like we said earlier, it could be all the damage from the, those tough fights. Not only that, it was the, the, the traveling is tough. Um, 40 years old, um, not old, but it's still a lot, but also there was a big delay too. That fight was supposed to take place yes. months before. Uh, so what did he do uh, at 40 years old? You know, we a lot of the the previous conversations with Golovkin, and I think in the lead up to Murata was he's training with Jonathan Banks now. Um, he's he's not sparring as much. He's pretty much changed everything about his uh, training camps. Uh, much different than Abel Sanchez's training camps. Um, so that could be a player role in it too. So, you know, what did he do in those months where we were waiting to see if he, if he can get this fight back on because he wanted to do it over in, in Japan and, uh, to make all the money there too. Yeah. At, at an advanced age, starting and stopping for camps is, is that much harder. So, you know, the recovery is different. Um, how many rounds you can do in sparring is different. So extending a camp for an, for an older, older fighter is not good. It's, it's much more difficult to deal with than the younger guys who can just kind of bounce back and get right back in the shape. Um, if you know, I, I mean, I've noticed Triple G's body, his last couple fights, he's looked the best he's ever looked yeah. even at 40 years old. I mean, he's shredded. So obviously he's doing things differently in terms of his strength and conditioning, in terms of his recovery. Um, you know, but yeah, I, I mentioned it earlier when we were talking about the ladies in London, you know, extending camp is not necessarily a good thing. Yeah, and and having Golovkin now back, um, this is the most active he's been in the last four years. Yeah. Murata to 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 Canelo. I mean, that's one positive if you if you're looking to back uh, Golovkin in, in in this fight is that he's back on a normal schedule. And another thing, if you want to back Golovkin, I went back and I looked and I tried to find some 
uh, numbers. I'm a numbers guy. You know this. Everyone that follows me, I have the CompuBox database at my, uh, uh, you know, to, to look up. And I'm looking at, I'm trying to find some slippage. I'm trying to find numbers wise. Like, what's different about Can uh, Golovkin uh, in his last four fights since uh, Canelo? I want to try to find something here. And in his last four fights, it's almost exactly like the previous 17. He's throwing. <laughs> it's always like it's like identical. It's freaking me out. Like sixty six punches thrown around in his last four fights, which is a very good number at one sixty. Yeah, sixty four in the previous seventeen, from Prasca to the second Canelo fight. So the volume is the same, thirty seven percent overall accuracy, exactly the same. Both both uh, stretches, forty three percent power accuracy in the That's previous. Awesome. In the previous 17, he's upped it now to 47 in his last four fights because he's probably not throwing uh, as many power shots. Uh, his jab has gotten better. <laughs> it's gotten more accurate uh, in his last four fights. And the one thing I wanted to see, and I, I did this, was I want to see the the defense because that's something uh, we have been talking about a lot. It's the same. He's getting hit with 35% power shots in his last four yeah, fights. But he's, he's getting hit cleaner. I've, that's that's I've, the thing. That's the thing. It's a, the, we'll give you all the numbers, but you got to use your eye test too. And we're seeing cleaner shots landing. We're seeing him react differently. Yeah. We're seeing a fighter who has fought four times in the last, what, four years? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So inactivity, which is like the age old question, should when you get up there in, four, up there in age or at the end of your career, is it good to take that much time off or is it should you stay active? I think activity is is king. I think you got to be active. Listen, if you got a bunch of tough fights in a row and you need some time off and you take it, sure. Like we had mentioned, Canelo, you know, he had that time when he had that that Golden Boy falling out. He was off for a year. Probably a good thing. The guy has had a long career. He's had a lot of tough fights, and then he came back on a tear. So some time off can be good, but when it comes to an older fighter and a younger fighter, activity is king. I mean, being active that's when you're sharp. That's when you're at that highest level firing on all cylinders. So it, it's hard to be at this level if you're not being active. Yeah, so that's that was an interesting exercise. Um, he's, I think he still has the work rate. I think he still has the jab. The uh, he doesn't The accuracy, and he can hit really hard. The only thing is he doesn't have the, the movement that B-Ball has. He's not a guy that's going to like be on the balls of his feet and in and out, in and out. He's like a plotter. He, he, that's the one thing. Uh, that that Golovkin uh, has done his whole career, but the the he still has the 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 numbers. I mean the the work rate. He still has the accuracy. Still has the jab too. That was a big big time uh, in the fight with Bivol. That was huge. Bivol's jab yeah. negated so much. Canelo just couldn't get going. Like he would start, he would put something together, and then Bivol would hammer him with a jab, and then Canelo would have to start over again. Next thing you know, yeah. rounds over. Yeah, I was front row for the Bivol Canelo fight as well. And I mean, the punches that were landing on Canelo's forehead, just, just thudding hard shots, just come like you could see them not rocking him, but resetting him every time it hit him. Um, so he never was able to gain any momentum. And he's a momentum fighter. Once he gets going, once he gets on that, letting those combinations go and stalking you, he never was able to do that with Bivol. Not to mention, he just never hurt him. But Triple G's jab is a thing of beauty, but it's, it's subtle. Canelo is not a very subtle guy. What he's doing in there is explosive. It's eye-catching. He's popping heads up. He's exploding. He's very fast. Triple G is very, very subtle, which is why I think the scoring has been kind of wonky in these two fights. Triple G hits you with these thudding hard jabs from six inches away. Doom, doom, doom. Yeah. So I, that's always been his best weapon. It's always set up his power shots. And that was his best weapon, his most consistent weapon in the first two Canelo fights. If he's going to have success on Saturday night, He's going to need to get behind that jab, and he's going to have to be very busy. Well, that's the one thing. He's always had the jab. I mean, that's 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 not gone it's away. Always been his best punch, yeah. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. not gone away over his last four fights. It's it's his bread and butter. It's everything that uh, he bases everything off of that. Not a, No no body punching. Uh, in the t 24 rounds with Canelo, Golovkin only landed 14 body shots. That's it. Eight in the first one, six in the second fight. It's like, yeah, I don't know. He... I forgot. What, I, I I saw it. He actually he he got Canelo's attention with a body shot in one of the early rounds in the first fight. I think it was round. It might have been round four. I don't know. But um, I remember thinking like, ooh, I I saw the elbow and I saw 
Canelo move away, and he actually got yelled at in the corner by Adrian Oso for, for backing up at the end of the round. I was like, oh, he got hit with a body shot, and then Triple G never went back to it in, yeah. in the next however many rounds they fought, whether 16 or 18 or whatever. It's like, man, and th- there's something there because Triple G is a great body puncher. Um, definitely gotten away from that. The two of them were headhunters in, in, in their two fights so far. But yeah, it makes for, for fun watches. And uh, I was yeah. just shocked, though. I was shocked that the glove can didn't uh, maybe cuff the ring a little bit better. It's things he could improve on. Um, do you think that either guy is looking at those last 24 rounds when they went in for a game plan for this fight? Or was it just so long ago and so much has changed? I think Canelo fights completely different now. Um, obviously, we went through with Golovkin. He pretty much fights the same, but the same wasn't enough uh, in the eyes of, of the judges. Do you think they're going to uh, would look back? Are they going to put any emphasis on those 24 rounds? Or do you think they may be drawing up new game plans? Oh, no, you have to. You have to. Even if you're just taking it at small chunks and what worked here, what worked there, you know, certain tells. There's some things that are, that are not going to change for either guy in terms of where they end up after certain punches, the way they move their head, um, certain movements that they do. They're, they're, they're so rehearsed, especially a lot of things Canelo does. Um, a lot of the, the in-between movements that he does in terms of his head moving his hands, a lot of that stuff is the same kind of movement he always does. So there's definitely going to be a lot of study of the last couple of fights. I also think that there's going to be a lot more variation in Canelo than Triple G. Like we just said, Triple G fights the way Triple G fights. Um He's just, it's good fundamental boxing. He's going to be in there. He's a plot. He's going to come forward. He's going to throw the jab. So uh-huh. uh, I think studying him is is probably going to be, uh, you're going to get more of it than Canelo. I love it. All right. Well, I don't think we have any, any more to break down. I think we uh, really nailed the uh, what these guys have done over their last couple of fights, where they're, uh, everything that has gone into uh, their careers on different trajectories. Uh, we're going to see them on the scales. Uh, today on Thursday is the uh, the press conference Friday weigh-in. And I want to remind everyone, Friday after the weigh-in, right after they step up the scale, we're going to be live on the John Boy Boxing YouTube page. Uh, Chris and I will be in studio together in New York City. Uh, I love watching weigh-ins. Weigh-ins are fun. Uh, being at weigh-ins are awesome. Um, this one should be pretty heated from what I've, what we've seen of these stare-downs. Uh, you've been in a lot of stare downs uh, at, at yeah. weigh ins and stuff. Like, what are you looking for in that final stare down for weigh in? Uh, I'm looking for your breath. I'm, I want to see how your chest moves. I want to see, I want to look in your eyes. I want to see your soul. Um, I want to, I want to see if you, if you get out of pocket and say something, you know, I want to, I want to see if I can say something that'll get you to, to, to get the, the pupil to dilate. So there's a lot of little tells you can, you can, you can figure out at a weigh in, especially when you're that close. Um, I'm curious for this one because I want to I want to I want to see their physiques. I want to see what Triple G looks like. I want to see them next to each other comparatively in terms of their body sizes. Now they're at 168, which there hasn't been a lot of talk about the weight class. Um, yeah. So yeah, th- th- this this is a very interesting weight uh, weigh in. Have you did you ever get under someone's skin? Do you say something at the weigh in and you got under a guy's skin? Um, I got into it a little bit with. Uh, with Tommy Coyle actually, uh, Spence and I kind of got a little shoving in going. Um, I've got uh, earlier in my career. I got into I got into fights all the time. The <laughs> Would you go into it like, hey, I'm going to shove him, or does it just happen? No, no, and I never, I didn't do that, but I'm sure guys do. But I always thought, I always looked that way, and it's like, all right, this this is the first fight of the night. I got to make weight, and I got to stare at this guy, and I got to beat him eye to eye. So I've been I've been doing that since I was my kickboxing days when I was a teenager. But uh, yeah, I, I always had a lot of uh, a lot of internal aggression when it came when it came to weigh-ins. It's the first time you see the man. It's the first time you're you're face to face with True. with the guy that you're gonna fight. Well, yeah, and and with like right up until the, the first belly, you got to do all the other obligations. And these guys have been for facing off all over the place. Didn't the lead up? <laughs> they were facing yeah. the home plate, Yankee Stadium, anywhere. You put these two guys together, they were facing off anywhere, anywhere. Uh, I hate that shit. I don't. I don't like to normalize that. I don't. I'm gonna normalize smelling your breath. Like I want to. Let's fight. I think I did that, Andre. When I was working at Bleacher Report, I had Andre Ward come in, and he was fighting one of the Smith brothers. It was Paul Smith, and they were like, wanted us to come up with an idea for a video to kind of promote the fight. And so we all got together to come up with something. So we had the two of them stare stare down in a room in like a studio, and then we did like an inner monologue of what what they're probably thinking. <laughs> and we had them voice it over. I gotta somehow unearth this. And that's like, funny. It worked. It was kind of funny. I always wondered like what they what people what they were thinking, what these two fighters are, are looking for. 
And I think uh, it's always different. I think it's always different. I mean, maybe some guys have in their head, like they're looking for certain things. Like, obviously I have certain things that I'm looking for, certain tells, but I don't know. Fight, fights are different. You get, you, some are a lot more emotional than others. Yeah. Canelo has been like, he's with this Golovkin fight. He's been really in, in the fate. Like he's like visibly getting close, which is a little strange. It's like, I, I usually Canelo pretty stoic. Uh, mm-hmm. I had that one moment with plant uh, with the slap, which I thought was yeah. hilarious. That, that was, was pretty, pretty cool. Good. That was pretty cool. Uh, yeah. So that's what it is. Friday. Big weekend ahead, Chris. You're going to hop on the plane. You're going to head over uh, to New York City, your real home. I know Florida is your home now, but New York City is your home. Are you going to eat some pizza? Can you eat pizza, Chris? Are you allowing yourself to eat pizza? Oh, yeah. right. I, I can eat whatever I want, but I'm definitely not eating it down here. Pizza down here is not the same. I don't even consider it pizza. Even New if York they style. say, like, hey, New York style, or you're like, give me a break. Bro. No, 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 no. They're lying. It, it's never the same. Never the same. So, bagels, Friday? too. There's, no, there's no. no bagels down here. No, I used to, when I was in West Virginia going to college, I used to have my, my dad would set, ship me bagels. And yeah. we would freeze them, <laughs> freeze them, <laughs> microwave, toast them. And we used to I, get like I do that three down dozen. Here. Three yeah, dozen. It, it, you may have to come they're back. They're currency down here. You can use them to, to fucking to buy things. <laughs> <laughs> Love it, bro. So Friday, full effect. Uh, Saturday night with the live stream. Uh, Friday, we will have our post-fight uh, um, weigh-in show. Uh, we'll do our top five trilogies on Friday because I'm, I'm all out of, t- of talking. I'm tired. Yeah. I'm done. I'm going to watch the Yankee game. And then, uh, yeah, Friday. I'll see you Friday. Great episode, Chris. Uh, big time fight this weekend. All right, everybody. Friday. We'll see you on Saturday.